So I'm going to spend the next uh, few minutes sort of switching gears uh, from what has been talked about this morning, but not totally, because one of the first slides that Ann had up was uh, in treating to target was target of quality of life. And I, and I really think that that's really, really important for our patients and really the impetus uh, for this discussion this morning. We're talking a lot more about stress in IBD. We're talking more, much more about so, uh, social stigma, talking about psychological sequelae of the disease, and really with that comes coping. The impetus for this talk was a discussion that I had with one of uh, my attending physicians months ago. And the talk centered on how well our children do or do not cope with the disease, and in particular, the children and adolescents who are on uh, exclusive enteral uh, nutrition and all that goes along with that and some of the pressures. And so I'll be talking a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but that was really what made me start thinking about what expectations do we have of our pediatric patients, uh, and how difficult is that for them to be able to do what we're asking them to do? So these are my objectives, just looking at psychosocial issues affecting pediatric patients with IBD, assessing coping skills in both the patients and their families, and providing anticipatory guidance related to the patient and family coping skills. And so just a little bit of background, this is not new information, but just sort of to set the stage. We know that IBD affects uh, a quality, quality of life. We know we're asking these patients to adhere to a, what sometimes is a difficult regimen, many medications, uh, and some medications requiring uh, us to have them come uh, every five or six or eight weeks and spend uh, several hours with us uh, away from school, away from their friends. Uh, uh, we know that uh, IBD can cause school difficulties. Uh, we know that some kids who were fairly active prior to being diagnosed with IBD are no longer able to be so active. And certainly, uh, research has shown that there can be decreased social competence. All of this leads to risk for depression, anxiety, social isolation, uh, poor self-image, uh, which can negatively affect uh, quality of life. So what are determinants of quality of life? Well, first of all, how does that patient cope with his or her new diagnosis, and how does that patient cope with the ongoing effects of IBD? And then secondly, is there any psychiatric comorbidity, and does that lead to uh, disability? So when are the stressors? We know there's stressors at lots of different times, but key times are going to be at diagnosis, when a flare occurs, and when treatment changes occur. Now granted, there's lots of other times when stress can occur. A new school year can cause much stress uh, in a pediatric uh, patient because maybe they had really good bathroom accommodations the prior year in school and now they're not so good. And so there's lots of other times when we know uh, these children can be very stressed. So this was a uh, study in the Journal of Pediatric Nursing uh, a few years back with 67 participants who were all adolescents. And, and I thought it was really a key study because you can see the very, very small percentage of patients are, that are satisfied with themselves, only 12%. That's a really low number. Uh, almost 2 thirds of these patients felt that IBD interfered with school. Almost a third of them reported school absences, but not all due to symptoms. And almost two-thirds of them reported treatment or symptoms uh, interfered with their leisure time, so things that they wanted to do with uh, their friends or their family. This is another study that looked at uh, challenges with 80 participants. And these children were a little wider age range, so both pediatric and adolescent patients, that, that looked at what were their concerns related to symptoms or treatments, 
uh, their feelings of vulnerability or lack of control? How did they perceive themselves? What were the benefits of social support and what were personal resources in coping? So some of the concerns related to, to treatment you may have heard from your patients before, whether they're pediatric patients or adult patients. So um, daily activities that get disruptive. So I can't do what I want to do because I have abdominal pain. Um, what food, uh, what effect do food restrictions have? Um, everybody else is eating and I'm not. Um, Tube feeding is embarrassing. Do I pull my tube in the morning before I go to school? Do I go to school with a tube in my nose and drink my uh, supplement during the day if I'm on uh, EEN or uh, PEN? Um, so certainly that can have an effect. <coughs> And then lastly, a lot of these children have not much energy. And how do they keep up with their friends? Um, it's difficult and sometimes embarrassing. They often feel uh, vulnerable. They feel a lack of control. So they feel weak. They feel like they're prone to having more infections than others. And that causes a lot of concern. Due to the uncontrollability of the disease, they don't know what's gonna happen next in some cases. And sometimes families, particularly mothers, uh, do go overboard when they have a flare. And privacy can be a problem. And this was actually a quote from the study from an adolescent patient. So this was not a seven-year-old. This was an adolescent who said, it's uncomfortable to have my mom watch me on the toilet. Well, that's very, very difficult, even for a younger adolescent to have that happen. But we know it happens because parents get very nervous at the sign of a flare. So we know they perceive themselves sometimes as different and sometimes as negatively. Why is everyone else growing and I'm not? I'm Cushingoid, I look different from everybody else, so kids make fun of me. Um, I'm left out because I look different. Uh, I'm afraid to tell my friends that I have IBD, so I make up something else to tell them so I don't have to say those words. Um, and I just wanna be treated like everybody else. So certainly we know there are benefits of social support. We know that it helps a lot for them to be able to talk to friends or family about their disease, particularly someone who has the disease. One of my adolescent patients, uh, she was uh, sort of adopted by a major league uh, baseball player when she was diagnosed. And, and that has made a world of difference to her because he has UC and she has Crohn's. And they have a very, very strong bond that has carried her through um, having an ostomy for two years during adolescence. Uh, and she has since had a uh, takedown, but it, it, was, it was a really tough time for her uh, from the time she was about 14 to 16. Uh, these children and adolescents uh, say that it helps their family relationships. It's, it's brought the family closer together. Uh, they say that their parents play an important role because their parents uh, can talk about it with them. Uh, it makes it easier to deal with uh, the disease. And then lastly, personal resources and coping. Coping can get better over time. Sometimes it can get worse over time, but Oftentimes, if it improves over time, they can say, I know now when I have a flare, what I need to do about it or, or how I need to approach it, and, and, that, and that can help. Uh, I, I think adaptation is a key part of co coping. Um, and the fact that these kids said, this disease can rule you or you can rule it, it, it is absolutely key. And we know that for our, for our stronger patients that, that may have very severe disease. And then lastly, can they focus on other areas of life where they excel? And so if some, uh, somebody is, is not able to participate in athletic activities anymore, but they're an excellent student, that might be where they can place more focus and still do some uh, other activities that may not be as physically involved. Some of our kids, uh, we, we had one patient who was uh, Olympic swim swimmer in the last Olympics, so it's not to say these kids can't do that, but some of them um, are just quite fatigued and don't have the physical ability that they had uh, prior to diagnosis. 
so family functioning. We know that the disease has a huge effect on families. And they've looked at the uh, levels of family functioning in IBD as related to both children with diabetes and healthy children and found that there's more family dysfunction uh, in IBD. Uh, mothers have described not a lot of internal support and often wish the family uh, was happier. Social support benefits. Uh, support from family and friends is a very positive influence. Uh, the more parental support there was, the uh, more uh, the parent-child relationship was strengthened. Um, it's uh, important to how IBD is viewed and experienced. If parents, uh, you know, de develop a woe is us attitude and you're not going to be able to do this, 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 and this, then of course the child or adolescent is not going to have as positive a, a view as they might in a family that says, yes, you have this disease, we're going to work hard to treat it so that you can do a lot of the things that, and that we can do a lot of the things that we want to do. And then certainly a lot of difficulty uh, coping when it's not discussed openly uh, with sensitivity. And we see the gamut. You know, we see families that can, that can talk very frankly and openly about it and others who uh, kind of push it under the rug. So really, uh, there are many different definitions of coping, but I, I liked this one uh, because it talks about a cognitive and behavioral effort to manage specific external or internal demands and the conflicts between them uh, that are praised as taxing or exceeding the resources of a person. And so what it's related to is this chronic illness. And certainly it's found to be a very strong factor related to outcomes in not just IBD, but other disease groups as well. And so I really like this uh, uh, common sense model of illness because what it does is say that the outcomes in other words, the uh, quality of life, uh, depression, uh, amount of anxiety that a patient has is related to disease severity, illness perception, and coping skills. And you know, we always see patients that have mild disease, we have patients that have severe disease, and, and we see how all the ones with severe disease don't cope the same way, and all the ones with mild disease don't cope the same way. And, and yesterday, uh, during one of the uh, early talks, they talked about two different uh, women, and one had milder disease than the other, but she wanted to die. And the other one, at least for a period of time, was coping well. So, so why, why is that when two patients have very similar disease and, and one copes much better than the other, whether they're a pediatric patient or an adult patient, and, and it's really illness perception and coping skills. And coping skills can either be uh, problem-focused or they can be emotion-focused. And problem-focused is really looking at trying to alleviate the problem that caused them the stress. Whereas emotion focus is they, they've still got the problem and they're trying to uh, improve the emotion surrounding it. And the literature shows that really a problem focused approach uh, is better than an emotion uh, focused approach. So what I'm not going to go into today is a whole bunch of information on coping skills, but these are uh, uh, a uh, list of the pediatric and adolescent coping scales that are uh, utilized in IBD, and this actually came from a uh, meta-analysis. And so you can see there's quite a few of them. Uh, the first one is a pain coping scale. Um, and there is only one scale, the CSI, that is used uh, just for uh, children. Uh, the coping inventory is used for children, adolescents, and parents. And you know, you might say, well, what's the best scale? What's the easiest scale? They're actually all fairly lengthy. Um, some of them has, have as many as 50 questions. Uh, we don't actually use coping scales, and I'll talk about that uh, on the next slide. We're trying very hard to improve our psychosocial assessment, and so 
what we've tried recently to work on, and, and this is a big uh, QI initiative for us, is to have all the providers doing uh, depression screening. And that's a huge task because we don't have a full-time psychologist in our clinic. And so to ask the providers now when they're trying to learn how to incorporate uh, depression screening into their day to add a 50 question, uh, some of them are 25, so they're not all that long, but add, adding a, uh, a a uh, lot of questions for them on coping uh, can be difficult. And so these are questions that I have um, actually adapted from uh, an uh, article in Health and Quality of Life Outcomes that are quick and easy for me. And I don't ask them every single time because you don't want to, it's just like depression screening. If you, if you screen for depression every time, they kind of know how to answer the questions and, and uh, it becomes less useful. And so um, once or twice a year when they're having difficulty, um, these questions are asked. And, and certainly it looks at what is the impact of the illness on them, looks at how does it affect their function, how does it affect what they want to do, what do they see as challenges or obstacles? And then how has it affected relationships? You can see for parents, there's not much in the way of coping scales. There's the, the uh, CHIP scale and the RSQ parent IBD, um, which in, where the uh, parent is actually reporting on the child's coping skills. And I think if you, if you get nothing else from this talk today, and those of you who are in pediatrics, and I know there are several of you out there that I know well and, and have been through this, if the parent is not coping well, the child is not coping well, no matter what. It's very, very uh, difficult. And so it might be more important to do a coping assessment on the parent than it is uh, for the child. So personal coping uh, resources, looking at what are the benefits of IBD? And you know, that's, that's a hard thing for a child or an adolescent to uh, figure out, but a lot of them have more maturity. Uh, they find ways that they can help other people. They become very involved in uh, support groups at, the, at their own level. Uh, they work with other uh, patients as uh, advocates. So there's a lot of ways that they can sort of expand their horizons uh, and see benefits of having IBD. Um, trying to adapt to having IBD is a huge challenge, but conquering that is, an, is, is even bigger. Um, and then certainly focusing on other areas of life, like, like I mentioned before, with um, with kids uh, that are uh, doing well academically, um, working on other projects kinds of things. Uh, they might excel in Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts, those kinds of activities. Um, it doesn't all have to uh, be um, related to what they can't do, but more what they can do. So these are just a list of some generic coping strategies uh, that uh, our uh, psychologist uh, uses, it, and they're uh, useful for both uh, uh, pediatric patients and adolescent patients, and certainly being realistic about the workload. A lot of our patients are very, very driven and sometimes overdo it, and so helping them understand what is reasonable to do um, and, and still, you know, be able to have the energy to uh, do all the things that they want to do. Uh, certainly exercise and a healthy diet uh, is helpful for anyone, whether they have IBD or not. Getting at least eight hours sleep a night, uh, because again, fatigue is a problem for a lot of them. Our psychologist has them do uh, some uh, journaling, which can be helpful. We have uh, recently instituted, because we do have a little bit more psychological uh, help recently, uh, is having them, uh, every patient who's diagnosed as a new patient, see our psychologist, uh, at, not on the first visit necessarily, but soon after the first visit, because we, know, we all know that there's a lot to absorb on the first visit. 
Um, but if they're not wanting to talk to a therapist, who can they talk to about their problem, whether it's a parent, a sibling, a teacher, or a friend? We all know that the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation Camp Oasis has been shown to help uh, coping with these children as well as local chapters. Uh, school accommodations can be huge and oftentimes parents and children don't know there can be school accommodations and just knowing that they have a bathroom pass that can be utilized at any time during class can help a lot with the uh, anxiety which uh, improves coping. And then learning relaxation techniques. So relaxation, relaxation techniques can just be simple deep breathing, having them close their eyes deep and deep breathe. Guided imagery, uh, our psychologist uses a fair amount of this. Uh, where, again, she has them just close their eyes, they're deep breathing, and they're imagining themselves in another place, such as, the, such as at the beach, and they are uh, hearing and smelling uh, what you would hear if you, if you were at the beach. Meditation uh, can also uh, be helpful where they're doing the same kind of thing. They're closing their eyes, they're deep breathing, and they're repeating certain words over and over again, such as relax, 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 to help uh, settle down. Other treatments, cognitive behavioral therapy um, has shown the most evidence for treating anxiety and depression, focusing on illness perception. Really, cognitive behavioral therapy looks at problem-solving techniques. And uh, they talked about, yesterday they talked about uh, CBT uh, and hypnosis with uh, teaching a lot of uh, nurses and uh, nurse practitioners some of these approaches because most of us don't have the psychological resources uh, that we need to uh, have. And, and then lastly, pharm pharmacotherapy. And, and pharmacotherapy is often used in lieu of some of these other treatments, but what I would say to you is pharmacotherapy should be an adjunct. It shouldn't be the only thing that's being done uh, for these children because a lot of the other uh, treatments will help in conjunction, and if the treatments are working for the patient, they may not need uh, pharmacotherapy. The problem with us prescribing pharmacotherapy is we aren't seeing them often enough to be able to assess uh, how, how they respond to it. So just having an IBD all access pass can relieve some anxiety, very small things. And then the uh, apps and websites, such as the uh, GI Buddy uh, Tracker, can be helpful. So parental coping. I, I said earlier, I said, if there's anything that you get from this, it's helping the parents cope helps the child cope. And that is a very, very strong predictor of quality of life outcomes for uh, not just the adolescent patient, but also the younger patient as well. So addressing medical conditions directly, managing stress, particularly in the mother, making sure there's a good support network, and avoiding helicoptering, which uh, Pam Morgan will be talking about a little later this morning. So I told you that the impetus uh, for this talk was uh, a uh, discussion that I had with one of the attending physicians about coping, and coping particularly when we're asking things of our patients that we're not even sure that we would be able to do ourselves. And this particular patient that uh, sort of started the discussion, uh, was diagnosed a year ago with Crohn's disease. So she was almost 11 years old. She came to us severely malnourished. She looked like she was about eight. And um, her father has Crohn's disease. He's been on biologic therapy for years. And somehow this diagnosis got missed. And I, I know there was a lot of um, uh, probably thinking that maybe it was the case, but denial uh, on the part of the parents. I'm not sure what happened with the pediatrician, but this was one of those cases where you looked at the growth chart and it just tanked over the past several years. So uh, she was a good candidate 
for exclusive enteral nutrition, which is what we put her on uh, right away. The parents did not and don't want uh, to use medications. We've had multiple discussions over time. Uh, she is now on partial enteral nutrition where she's drinking a pediatric supplement seven and a half bottles a day throughout the course of the day from the time she gets up in the morning till the time she goes to bed. And she eats a specific carbohydrate diet for dinner. She is now, a year later, in her first year of middle school. Anybody have any thoughts about coping for this child? Probably difficult, right? There's guilt in the parent's part because it went on for a very long time when they probably knew things weren't great. Uh, she was one of those patients that walked through the door and you knew the diagnosis. Um, but asking what we've asked of her is a lot. She's a very, very bright child. And so she very clearly understood that this is what she had to do because her parents did not and would not use medication. So when I asked her how she was coping, she said, spending time with friends helps, I'm doing well. The mother has extreme anxiety, and, and I suspect that recently she's probably started seeing someone for her anxiety, which is a good thing. When I asked her how she was coping, she told me that exercise helps and she's doing well. I probably would, you know, I expected maybe a different answer, but, you know, I think she thinks she's doing well, and maybe she thinks she's doing better than she was. Now, she met with our psychologist. She didn't meet with her initially. Uh, the parents didn't think that it was necessary, but, but I finally convinced them that I thought it would be a good idea because I said to them, think of what we're asking her to do. Uh, we're asking her to do something that would be very difficult for us, and we don't know how she's dealing with that. And so when she talked to the, the uh, psychologist, she said she's embarrassed about drinking her supplements at school. So what she does is she goes, and her parents knew she was doing this, she goes to the library and she helps the librarian because then she doesn't have to answer questions about why she's drinking this. Um, she says she sometimes gets angry, which is completely normal. She said she doesn't like having to spend a lot of time in the bathroom, which again is completely normal. And then lastly, she had told her friends she had leaky gut and she had stomach aches and mouth ulcers because she didn't want to say inflammatory bowel disease, which a lot of them don't, right? So she did have some issues and we knew she, she did and she's somebody that I think should continue to be seen by psychology, but for right now, the parents are uh, declining it. I was very happy that they were willing to do it even to begin with. So the plan was to offer to continue to work with her as possible and work on communication with her friends, finding one or two very, very close friends that maybe she could talk about it with, uh, as well as her family, because in spite of the fact that her father has Crohn's disease, they don't talk about it very much. What kind of physical activity can she get involved with in addition to Girl Scouts, which she's already involved with? She was a physically fairly active child at one time, and now she's not so active. I think she would be a great candidate for Camp Oasis. And then some of the other uh, treatment plans that I've already talked about, deep breathing meditation, guided imagery, and uh, cognitive behavioral therapy would all be appropriate uh, for her. Um, she continues to do fairly well. She's uh, doing well on, uh, for now on her um, diet, uh, but I think that she still has a long ways to go, and she does have a little bit of uh, inflammation on her last uh, scope in fecal calprotectin. So just in closing, I, I think the things to think about are you know, it, it, this, this disease, you can do everything right and there's still uncontrollability. And that's important to know for our patients uh, when it comes to coping. Uh, and that perceived lack of control, even if you're doing all the things that you're supposed to do, makes you anxious, it can make you depressed, it can isolate you, and it can uh, give you poor body image. There are many published coping instruments in IBD, but you don't have to use that if you, if you don't have a lot of time uh, to be able to, to assess this. You need to be asking questions. 
And then lastly, the family member support is super, super important. And I like this little cartoon because it says, I'd like an order of optimi optimism, uh, please. And the guy in the therapy hut drive through says, sorry, the breakfast menu ended at 10.30. And I think that really depicts how our patients have to uh, learn to deal with their disease. If something doesn't go well, then find another way. Thank you.